So we are nearing the end of our series in the life of Abraham. It's looking at a journey of faith that this man Abraham has been on. And I don't know about you, but along the way, I've, I've taken encouragement, challenge from the way that he's lived and tried to follow God through some very difficult times in his life. And this morning, we're going to be looking uh, at Abraham's life, again, a very extraordinary circumstance as God helps him learn to let go and trust him. Anybody need help in their life letting go sometimes and learning to trust God with everything that you have? I think this is probably Genesis 22, one of the most intense and beautiful stories in all of scripture because it shows us the lengths to which God will go to test our faith and to help us learn to trust him. And as we're about to see, For Abraham, that means that God's going to put his finger on his greatest treasure in life and ask Abraham to let go of that treasure and to trust God above everything else. I'm reminded of the time that I bought a new flat screen television and uh, I shopped for it, I researched, so I was pretty excited. And Best Buy delivered the TV to the house Judah and Noah and I went downstairs and we put it up on the wall and then we sat back and we watched sports in 4K. Anybody know what I'm talking about? (laughs) It's like coming out of the dark ages. And it was pretty amazing and it lasted for a short while because just a few weeks later, I started sensing that God was telling me to take the TV back to Best Buy. Has anybody ever had an experience like this before? God didn't speak audibly in this moment to me or anything, but he spoke in the way that he often does and and the the way that I was understanding that he was trying to direct me. And quite honestly, I started to get this really uneasy feeling because on the one hand, I really wanted to obey God. And and I've been a a Christian for 30 years, so I've had these experiences along my journey And I I knew that God had a purpose in all of this, asking me to let go of this TV. But at the same time, it was so difficult because I so enjoyed this thing. And to get it down off the wall and put it in the box was going to be a real pain. So on day 60 of the 60-day return window, (laughs) my sons and I took the TV down off the wall, we put it in the box, and I drove it to Best Buy left it there, and as I drove off that day, I had this incredible feeling of relief and peace because I knew that I had passed the test and I had let go of my treasure. I had let go of my treasure. Hey, Greg, come on. I didn't tell you how far into the return window God started speaking to me. Here's my point this morning, though. (laughs) Is that our nature as humans is that we want to cling on to things, right? We, We find things that are valuable to us. They become a treasure, and our grip tightens around them, and it becomes very difficult for us to release them to God. For me, it was a TV, but for those of you in this room, it could be a hundred different things, right? It could be cars and boats, houses, investments. It could be dreams that you have of starting a business, or it could be a relationship that you're clinging to. But whatever it is that you are clinging to, whatever that treasure is, God wants you to learn to let it go to him and to trust him. And that is what Abraham learned in this journey in Genesis chapter 22. So turn with me this morning to verse one as we look at this journey in Abraham's life of learning to let go and trust God. It says in verse one, sometime later, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. So right up front, the writer of Genesis is telling us what this story is about. It's about a test that God was bringing into Abraham's life. And notice, church, there's a difference between God testing us and God tempting us, amen? We test students when they're in school to see how much they've learned. 
We tempt someone in order to see if they'll fall. The Bible says that God will never tempt us. In James, it says, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And I know sometimes in the process of being tested, sometimes each of us can be tempted to take the easy way out, to to go our own way. But that's not God's purpose for us in our tests. God's purpose for us as it was for Abraham, we see is in verse 12 here, it says, God said, don't lay a hand on the boy, don't do anything to him, now I know that you fear God. See, this was the end of the test, this was the purpose of this, for God to see if Abraham truly trusted him, if he released full control to God with his life. And Abraham is going to have to trust God and the command of God, just as you and I are going to have to learn to trust God in our trials and realize that he is good, he is loving, he wants what's best for us, but oftentimes it looks very different than what we would design for ourselves. And this wasn't Abraham's first test. If you start in the beginning of his life in scripture in Genesis 12, you would realize that this was his 10th test. He had already been tested nine different times with his first test being in chapter 12 when God asked him to leave his country and his people, to leave everything behind and to follow him. And Abraham, we read, left God in that moment without questioning. He passed the test. And along the way, if you follow his life story, sometimes God tested Abraham and he failed. And other times, God tested Abraham, and he passed. Does it sound a little bit like your life? But here in Genesis, God is giving Abraham his 10th and his most difficult test of all. Now, when you peel back the the language in Hebrew of what test means, it refers to putting someone or something under scrutiny to determine its value or its usefulness to test the thing. In 1 Samuel 17, David tested Saul's armor and he found that it wasn't sufficient. In Deuteronomy 8, God tested the Israelites to see if they were faithful, if they really trusted him. And how many of you know God will allow tests into our lives? Because he wants us to learn where we need improvement. He wants us to learn how spiritually mature we've become. If you want to know what your grade is in terms of how you're matriculating as a student of God, then you can thank God for the tests that he brings into your life because they allow you and God to put a mark on your paper to help you determine whether you're really growing in faith as a disciple of his. That's what he was doing with Abraham with this test. It says in verse two, then God said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And I want you to go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Now you remember that Isaac was the miracle baby. He was born to Abraham and Sarah when Abraham was 100 years old. This was the boy that God had promised Abraham that all of the promises were going to be fulfilled through. It was through Isaac that Abraham would become the father of kings and nations. And so when Abraham looked at Isaac, he saw more than just a little boy. He saw the embodiment of all of God's promises in this one individual. And so by the time God spoke this command to Abraham in Genesis 22, Isaac would have been somewhere between 20 and 30 years of age. And so you have to remember at this time, too, they didn't have a social security net to grab, to grab people when they fell. They didn't have Roth IRAs or social security, so your children were both your security and your future. And so you can understand why for Abraham, Isaac was more than just a son. He was everything to him. He was the present. He was the future. And I want to point out two very interesting things here in the text that God said to Abraham. He said in verse 2, take your son, your only son whom you love. 
Now, we know that God is love, and you would think that by this point in the Bible, the word love would have already appeared in either defining God's love or the love of a mother for a child, but this is the very first time in all of Scripture that the word love is mentioned, and it's mentioned, listen, church, in relation to a father giving up his son. What is God speaking to us about love? But this is a really big deal. The second thing that we see here is that Isaac is called Abraham's only son. Now, how many of you know that Abraham had another son? What was his name? And he was the son of Abraham's relation with Sarai's servant, Hagar. But God refers to Isaac here as his only son. And see, what we have to understand is Isaac is the promised child. He is the miracle child. In Galatians 4, we read that Ishmael was the son of the flesh. He was the son uh, from the act that Abraham took out of his own initiative to do God's will. But Isaac is described as the son of promise. And the reason that this is so important for us to grasp because is right here in Genesis. We begin dealing with something called typology. So Jesus, Isaac, is a picture of Jesus here in Genesis 22 for us. God puts this in the text so that we can begin to see who Jesus is and what he's done in his character. And so here, for example, Isaac had a very special birth. It wasn't supposed to happen. He was born to a 90-year-old mom and a 100-year-old father. And we read that Jesus in the Gospels had a very special birth. He was born to a virgin. So both of these seemed impossible, but Isaac is a picture of Jesus who would come and fulfill the promises that God had made to Abraham. So when God says to Abraham, I want you to take your son, I want you to take your only son whom you love and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. God is declaring in this moment, church, I know exactly how important this son is to you, Abraham. And I know the cost of what it is that I'm asking you to do. I get it. Sometimes we can read the Bible so often and read stories like this one so often that it loses its impact. But if you really allow this story to sit with you, it's pretty unsettling, isn't it, church? God is asking Abraham to take his beloved son and destroy him with his own hands. How many fathers would follow that command if God gave that to them? And this is especially unsettling because the entire ethic of the Bible stands against human sacrifice. There's a very famous Nobel laureate Holocaust survivor named Elie Wiesel. And he said about this passage after reading it, that God was wrong for asking Abraham to do what he did. And Abraham was wrong for agreeing to go through with it. See, there's something about this, if you really read this, that seems pretty messed up to people on a surface reading. Why would God ever do that? Why would Abraham even say yes to this? There's another pastor and theologian named Leonard Sweet. He says that Abraham should have been obedient to God and gone up the mountain, but he should have kicked and screamed and pleaded and argued the whole way there. See, they're getting at something in the story here about the difficulty of what God was asking him to do, the impossibility of what God was asking Abraham to go ahead with. But the Bible tells us that Abraham didn't kick or scream or yell at God, he didn't argue, but he simply obeyed God's command. It says early in the morning, early the next morning, Abraham got up, he loaded his donkey, he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac, and when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. You know, the Bible doesn't describe any kind of conversation that's going on here between God 
and Abraham. Abraham's not asking God any questions, but if I could get into the mind of Abraham, if I could think of my own questions in this moment, I know I'd be saying, God, why is it that you're asking me to give up my son? And if I do this, how will the promise that you made to me ever be fulfilled? And, and by the way, God, isn't what you're asking me to do what the wicked Canaanite pagans do with their children? God, I don't understand what you're asking me to do. But instead of protesting or bargaining or even delaying, Abraham got up the very next morning and traveled, the Bible says, for three days to a place called Moriah. Now, this place is very significant in the story of salvation, and it will be for the next few thousand years because we learn in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles 3.1 that Moriah was in Jerusalem. It was the location that Solomon built the temple upon. It is where the modern Dome of the Rock mosque stands. It is where something of a sacrifice was made between a father and a son in this location. And it was here in this place that Abraham said to his servants, I want you to stay with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it on his son Isaac, it says, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. Now, there are very different ways of looking at this passage, but I want you to take notice of the pronouns that Abraham uses in his instructions here. Will you look at this with me if I can have this on the screen? He said to his servant, stay with the donkey while I and the boy go over there we will, what church? Worship. And then who? We will come back. Some people think that Abraham was using these pronouns of we will go, we will come. Because let's face it, who wants to set off alarms, and make your son or the servants think that something weird is about to happen? And it wasn't beyond Abraham and his own life and story to tell half-truths, to fudge things a little bit when it worked well for him to save his own skin. So some people believe Abraham was in this moment just basically saying, I got to go do what I got to do, and this is how it's going to work. We're going to both come back, but he knew differently. But I think, church, that there was something else going on here. See, I think that after tests one and three and five, six, seven, eight, nine, I think that Abraham in this, his final exam, that Abraham had come to know the will, the character of God, that Abraham had come to a place of believing to the point of looking so foolish and so stupid for the belief that he had in God that he even knew that God could bring those who died back from the dead. Amen? Amen. And we see this in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who would embrace the promises was about to sacrifice his son, his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. But listen, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive back Isaac back from death. So we have the writer of Hebrews looking back thousands of years on Abraham's experience and telling us by divine revelation that Abraham was living and existing on a different plane than just the natural. That he was understanding that the God who created him and who made his promise, who had rescued him, who had given him a child in his old age, that same God could be trusted here on the mountain with his son. And that that God, even if he laid his hands on his son, that God could bring that son back from the dead to fulfill his promise. This is the faith that was being revealed in this moment in Abraham's life. But yet, Abraham still had to go through with all the gritty details of obeying God's command and putting his son on the altar. 
Chuck Swindoll, in his commentary on Genesis, writes this. I want you to place yourself in this old man's sandals. I want you to feel the warmth of your son walking close beside you. Smell the firewood he's hauling up the mountain. Feel the knife bumping against your hip with every stride that you take. And envision the summit where you will plunge your razor-sharp knife into the chest of your only child. Does that bring it a little bit closer to home for us? It's almost too much to imagine. See, Abraham didn't know all that was going to happen next. He hadn't read Genesis 22. But this is what it tells us of his experience. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, Son, God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went on together. See, from as early as Isaac could remember, he had helped his father with these burnt sacrifices. He knew the routine. He knew what came next. Dad, where's where's the lamb? Dad, what's happening here? And the literal translation of Abraham's response to his son would have gone something like this. Son, God will see to the lamb for himself. God will see to it. And of course, in this moment, even the words that Abraham was speaking were a foreshadow of the story of another father and son 2,000 years later when God would see to a lamb for himself when the beloved and only son of the father would become an atoning sacrifice to free us from the death that we deserve as a consequence for our sins there on Moriah. But in this moment, Abraham still had to offer his sacrifice on the altar. It says when they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar and he arranged the wood And he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. This part rips me up. For any of you here who are fathers, I mean, I have a 16-year-old son. I have a 14-year-old son. The image or the idea of having my son lie down on an altar, removing my knife with the intention of Killing and destroying my son is just overwhelming for me to think about. And what's absolutely incredible in this moment is that Isaac is silent. Isaac, the beloved son of the father, the promised son through whom will come blessing to the world, doesn't struggle or fight with his father. And remember, church, Abraham's 120, maybe 130 years old. He's got a strong young man who just hauled all the wood up the mountain for the sacrifice. Isaac could have pushed his father away. He could have crawled off that altar at any moment, but instead he crawled upon the altar obediently. He loved his father. He trusted his father's direction, and he was not afraid of death. And as quickly as he climbed upon the altar, Abraham took out his knife and was ready to slit his son's throat. Just as the blade was at his neck, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. 
Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, even your only son. God's timing is really crazy, isn't it? Like at the last moment, God intervenes, but he let this play out to the very last second. Why would God do that? Why didn't he just stop Abraham when he got to the top of the mountain and said, you've done enough. You carried the wood. You brought the boy. We're good. Just go back and live your life. God didn't stop him until the blade was almost breaking the skin. And I believe that it was to show Abraham, to show everyone else who would ever come after him, that Abraham had fully learned to let go and trust God with his greatest treasure in life. He had passed the ultimate test. It probably seems crazy to us sometimes. Well, God will put his finger on something in our life and say, that thing's become a treasure. And I, I want to ask you to release it to me. Can you let go of that thing, even that good thing? I had someone this week in our body, I heard that God had asked them to let go of something that had become a dream in their life, something that was very important to them. And they came to the place of letting that thing go, just giving it away to God, saying, God, if you want to just take this, you can have it. It's going to cost me. But God, I want you to have it. And do you know what happened? Just in the days after them letting go of that thing, God gave it back to them. He gave it back to them with more, with blessing. See, God isn't just there to, to beat us and to be a mean God, he's a good God. And sometimes he brings us to that place to say, I want your heart. I want you, I want all of you. I'm better than that thing. It's going to fade, it's going to, to drift away. There's gonna be some new thing, but I'm here and I wanna be all and all for you in your life. Will you give it to me? I remember that from, for me when I was in my 20s and I wondered, God, am I ever going to get married? And I remember coming to a place in my life after striving, <laughs> trying to make relationship work, and it failed. And I remember saying, God, I'm coming to the altar. I'm going to just put this here to you. My, my, my desire to be married, God, I'm single, and I, I, I want to have a relationship. And I remember putting it there on the altar for the Lord, and the Lord gave it back to me. And he gave me way more than I could have ever asked her. Father, imagine. And see, sometimes it doesn't come back to us the way that we think, but it's not about the exercise of doing something to get something from God. It's about the exercise of being obedient and allowing God to use the tests in our lives to help us let go and learn to trust him, just as Abraham did in this moment. It says in verse 13, that God did a great work. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its thorns. He went over, took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place. Places are very important in the Bible. The Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. And to this day, it is said, on the mountains of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, a better translation of this phrase, the Lord will provide, is more literally, the Lord will see to it. Isn't that what God did in Abraham's life? The Lord saw to Abraham's test. He saw to supplying everything that he needed in that moment. And when we come to a trial in our life that seems impossible, a test that seems overwhelming, we can say, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh, I'm calling this place Jehovah Jireh because I know that God sees, and that God will see to it in my life. What is the treasure today in your life? What is that thing that God might be speaking to you about right now? Maybe the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on something, a treasure that you've held so tightly to, and God is saying, I want you to release it to me. 
And maybe it's just you and your heart of hearts saying, God, I give it to you. It's a dream. God, it's a thing, but I release it to you. God knows that when you learn to trust him and when you learn to let go of those things, that you will walk in a deeper revelation of his love, of his goodness, that you will walk the way that Abraham walked in his final exam as he learned to give everything to the Lord. And see, we don't have to wait until trials come into our lives to crush us and overwhelm us. Because oftentimes, like for me, hard-headed guy here, it's taken a crisis in my life, and then I say, oh, I guess I, God, I, those things aren't as good as I thought. God, I want you. Have you been there before? And God uses pain in our lives to bring us to those places. But what if we just live in a way where we're constantly offering on the altar these things that seem so important to us? God, I'm just gonna put this back on the altar. I'm just gonna give this back to you today. I just want you to know this is yours, this dream, this desire, this person, this relationship, this thing, God. And see, that's, that's where it belongs. It belongs on the altar. And I love how this story ends because it shows us that God understood the things that Abraham walked through and, and yet he rewarded him for his obedience. It says in verse 16, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, Abraham, because you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Can I invite the worship team to come this morning? Can we just close our eyes for a moment? Can you just picture with me in your imagination an altar. I just want you to ask God, God, what is it that you would have me place on the altar today? What is that thing? And maybe it's not a thing. Maybe it's just you just saying, God, here I am again, giving my life to you giving my whole heart to you on the altar. God, we give these things to you. God, we want to just live in the peace of knowing that there's nothing that we're holding back. You know, the Bible tells us that the same God, Jehovah Jireh, who provided for Abraham in that place on Moriah, in his most desperate hour, has also, in his son, provided for us, for our most desperate need. John called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he would embrace a cross, he wouldn't argue or complain, but out of his love for his father, 
he climbed that hill and he allowed his body to be beaten, to be crucified, and his blood flowed so that you and I could experience a new life, life to the fullest. John 3.16 says, God loved the wor- so loved the world in this way that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And I wonder if today is the day that God is inviting you to put your trust in Jesus, to take hold of this gift that's being extended to you. And do you know what you have to do? You have to believe by faith. The same thing that Abraham did. He was a man of faith. He's the father of our faith. Would you put your trust in Jesus today? God, we just thank you so much that you've given us everything that we need in Jesus. And we thank you that you are working in us, that you are developing our faith. Help us learn to trust you more and more. 